So, what we're going to do today is talk about everything that you're going to need to do some recording, whether it's in your practice room, which we strongly, strongly uh, advise, and also in your lessons, all right? Even if you get two, three, four, five nuggets of wisdom out of your lesson, being able to go back and hear exactly what your professor was talking about is, is just monumental, all right? You can go back and listen and be like, that's what they were talking about. Got it. Um, we're also going to talk about why you need it, and then we're going to talk about uh, how it works. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a few different methods of doing this. We're going to talk about using your smartphone. The amount of computing powder, power in smartphones now is absolutely amazing. Um, and if you want to move past that, uh, we've, we've got a couple of gear setups, a couple scenarios that we're going to walk through. Uh, that could be advantageous to you. So, that being said, we have a couple disclaimers that we're going to go over. First, anything that we use in this presentation is very, very commonly found in the marketplace. Right? We are not sponsored by, nor do we sponsor any manufacturer, brand, uh, model of microphone, any of that stuff. We are in no way getting compensated for this, so what we're using just happens to be what we have. All right? This is not the only way to do this. All right? This is how we do it, how we have had success doing it, but this is not the only way to go about it. This is not concrete. And the last thing is please try this at home. The only way that you're going to get better at this is to do it yourself. All right? The more you do it, the better you get. So we're going to start at the beginning. So first, what is recording? So the, if you look in Britannica, this is the definition that comes up. It's the transcription of vibrations in the air that are perceived as sound onto a storage medium. Basically, we're going to take the sound of your tuba, we're going to do some converting of different forms of energy, and we're going to save it onto a storage medium. So, in this case, an SD card for our presentation. And then this is, this is the path of how a recording gets made. You start with your acoustic energy. So in this case, it's gonna be the tuba. We're gonna convert that acoustic energy into an electric energy or analog signal. And then we're gonna save it into a digital file. So first we're going to talk about microphones. Microphones are how we're going to capture that acoustic energy. So a microphone is what we call an input transducer. And a transducer is a device that converts variations in a physical quantity, such as pressure or brightness, into an electric signal or vice versa. In this case, the pressure that we're talking about is sound pressure. So acoustic energy. And then we're going to use the microphone to convert that into electric energy. <coughs> First we're going to talk about the dynamic microphone. It's made up of three components. A diaphragm, a metal coil known as a voice coil, and a magnet. The voice coil is attached to the back side of the diaphragm. And as acoustic energy makes contact with the diaphragm, It'll move the diaphragm like this, moving the, the voice coil back and forth, passing through the magnetic field. And as that voice coil moves past that magnet, that's how it translates the acoustic energy into an electric signal. And then that gets shot down the XLR cable down to the recorder. The next microphone is a condenser mic. And no, that is not the cross-section of a mouthpiece. So for this, it's, it's similar principles, but it's a little different buildup. So how we had the diaphragm in the dynamic microphone, now there's two pieces of metal. There's the diaphragm, and then there's a back plate. When you, this is also known as a capacitor. 
and a capacitor is a device that is used to store electrical energy. Now, putting two pieces of metal together doesn't automatically store that much electric charge or energy. So we have to send an electric signal through the XLR cable, known as phantom power, in order to charge that component. And then that's how it stores the electric energy. When the acoustic energy hits that front diaphragm, it moves closer or further away from that back plate. And that's, it causes a change of capacitance. The change of capacitance is that translation of the acoustic energy to the electric signal that's gonna go down to our recorder. So with all these microphones, there's so many different ones. Uh, and, and to be quite honest, um, the, the best microphone, and this is a question we get uh, a lot, especially with dealing with low brass, you know, what's the best microphone? It's whichever microphone you've got. We're not in the business of telling you what to do it. Get a couple, if you can afford it, try them out. Some work better than others. Um, but whichever one you have, it's a pretty darn good one to start off with. So with each of these microphones, each of them has a different pickup pattern. Some have different hot spots. Some have nulls where you're not going to pick up anything. Um, and this, this is kind of hard to think of, at least for me, I'm a tuba player, uh, in three-dimensional space. Uh, so <laughs> I went to uh, the craft store and I had craft time and painted some of these in three-dimensional space. The first one that we're going to talk about is, is Omni. Omni is going to give a fairly even pickup all around the sphere. All, right? all around that diaphragm is going to be fairly hot and consistent. All right? So you can twirl around. So you see the omnidirectional. That's this guy. All right? So up next, and this is probably one of the more common ones that you're going to come across, is cardioid. Cardioid, cardio, heart, that's, that's the typical shape, which carving a heart out of a sphere of styrofoam proves very difficult. Um, so what you'll see is the green is the hot area, just like in Omni, and then you start to see it fade away as it starts to reject sound. So on the back of that, where it dips back in, it's just like that null. It's not going to receive very much information, if any at all. All right, if you can spin that around. So, there you go. All right, next one, supercardioid. So this one, you're going to get a little bit more rejection around the sides, but as you tighten in that pattern, you're going to create a lobe on the back of that microphone. In doing that, you're starting to pick up noise, unwanted noise, or ambient sounds from the room. Now, a lot of people are like, well, is that good? The standard audio answer is, well, it depends. It depends on if you want it. So some people, they want the rejection around the sides, but they want a little bit of that ambient room sound. All right? So as we tighten the pattern even more, we come up to hypercardioid. And you'll see the green sp space gets even tighter. Rejection starts to creep up even further. If you can spin the, uh, the, the big one around. So rejecting all of that. But like I said, as you shrink that down, you increase the lobe on the back of that microphone. So now you're picking up even more. So a lot of times when we start to, um, if you saw the blues concert last night, we close mic a lot of our instruments in the blues because we want that rejection from the sides. We want the person that that mic is, is directly in front of. We don't necessarily want their neighbors. All right? So that's an a instance that you would use these. So as you shrink that pickup area even more, you come up with the last one that we're going to talk about, and that's the figure eight pattern. So we've shrunk that down, it makes the lobe on the back even bigger. So you come up with a figure eight pattern. 
All right. So we use these occasionally. We use these. Uh, in fact, we'll be using them in the concert band tonight. Uh, so some of the things we're talking about, take notice of them because you know we actually use these. So two on this side, ambient sound of the room. Nothing around from the side, so that way we can only get tuba and that natural ambient sound. Uh, the other thing that we use these for, uh, sometimes with our clarinets, we will place that in between them so it will pick up clarinet on each side. It cuts down on all of our cabling and, it's, and it still sounds really good. It's really, really important to know how that diaphragm is orientated inside that microphone. So that way you know where the hottest pickup point of that microphone is, right? For this one, that diaphragm is pointing straight. For this one, the diaphragm is on the front side of this grill. So with those microphones and where that pickup pattern is, you can use those to your advantage, right? By putting a microphone directly on axis with the sound source, kind of creates a false sense of hope, especially when you get really close. All right, and we'll talk about, uh, about that here in a minute. So as you rotate that microphone off axis, say the tuba player sitting here, and you're getting a really thick, full sound, uh, it, that might not necessarily be what's happening in real life. So to get a more accurate picture, you can rotate this, or you can place it just off of the hole of the, the throat of your belt. All right? And we'll talk about that here in just a minute with some practical stuff. Effective range of a tuba is about 40 hertz to 400 hertz. Euphonium is about 80 hertz to 700 hertz. And that's important here in just a second when we start to look at a, at a real-time analyzer so that you can see just how these things pick up and how you can give yourself those false hopes with the, the boosted low end. So, not all microphones are, respond the same. Right. We'll come back to it here in just a second. I can show you this uh, SM57 that we've got here, Sure SM57, how it picks up so you know that the characteristics of that. You know that there's going to be a boost in a certain area and there's going to be a cut in a certain area. So we're going to switch this slide over uh, to a real-time analyzer. Please remember that we are audio professionals, and we are not professional tuba players. <laughs> this is where we get to nerd out a little bit. All right, so Alex is going to play for me. You can see the sound of my voice and how it's affecting those microphones that are hanging right above your all's head. All right. So Alex is going to play, and I'm going to demonstrate a couple of the things that we just talked about. Um, the uh, proximity of a microphone has a lot to do with how it responds, as well as the uh, frequencies of that individual microphone. So here you can see fundamental and overtones. So proximity, by putting that mic down inside his bell, is going to boost his low range. Did it get higher? All right. So, John, can you pull that the high pass filter? Can you do that again? So just so you can hear what that sounds like. radio announcers that get really close to the mic. That's what we're talking about as far as proximity effect. All right? It adds that false sense of security in your low range. It doesn't give you that accurate picture of what you're putting into the mouthpiece is actually coming out of your bell. All right? So a lot of classical recordings that you hear were probably recorded with either a large or small diaphragm microphone. And uh, condenser microphone because they generally are a little more sensitive 
and have better transient response. A transient response is a measure of a microphone's ability to capture very sharp, fast musical attacks and signal peaks. So that's good for capturing all of that little detail and, and nuance of a, of a live performance. The main limitation of transient response is a diaphragm's mass. So condensers generally exhibit better transient response than even the best dynamics because the dynamics diaphragm is a little heavier with that coil on the back. Uh, so close miking a tuba with a dynamic mic may be a little better because it, it can handle those loud sound pressures a little better. And so sticking, sticking that SM57 into the bell of a tuba isn't going to distort as much as if you were to do that with this microphone, because this diaphragm is a little more sensitive than, than that one is. All right, so I, I talked about um, the, the different uh, frequency ranges, tuba, the effective range right here, about 40 to 400. Tenor trombone is, is close to the same as uh, euphonium. Um, and then here's those two mics and the frequency response of those two mics. So I can see that there's going to be a bump up here around 6K on that SM57, this guy right here, versus that KSM32, that condenser is going to give you a pretty uniform flat response. So that's going to tell you that if you've got some funky stuff going on, it's you, it's your sound, it's, it's not the microphone. Now, it could be your recording device, but chances are it's you. It could also be the placement of your microphone, too. It's you. Because what, what these frequen, fre, frequency response graphs show, these are set under ideal conditions of temperature and pressure and, and elevation. Um, and so it, it's a starting point to show how that microphone is going to actually be affected by sound. And then, as you can tell with that proximity effect, the closer you get to your sound source, the more of a boost you get. So just because there's that roll-off on the 57 or 58 doesn't mean that it can't capture that low end. It just means that at that two feet away from the sound source, it's not going to capture it as much as if it's closer. You have to hold that microphone up somehow. So you need a good solid mic stand. Uh, we recommend something that you can get that, that microphone above the bell of the tuba. And so getting a nice tall mic stand with a boom that you can move around is, is definitely Or putting necessary. it on a table. So this is actually this, what this I did you do. for a recording session where my mic stands I had weren't tall enough. So I had to get a table and I put the mic stands on top of the table to get above the tuba players who were up on a stage. And so it goes back to one of our points is that you just have to try stuff and experiment and improvise sometimes with recording. The next path in our recording chain is the cable. So we're going to talk about the XLR cable, which is the three pinned cable up here important to take away from this is that the female end of the cable is going to get plugged into the microphone and then the male end of the cable is going to get plugged into your recorder or your mic preamp. This is important if you have really long cable runs because after you run a hundred foot long cable down a hallway and then it, to your recorder from the stage and then you realize you ran it the wrong way. It's very annoying. So <laughs> running it the right way the first time is definitely a plus. Now, an XLR cable, like I said, has three pins. The pin one is your ground wire, and this is actually how phantom power gets sent from your recorder all the way to the microphone. And then the other two pins are your signal pins, which actually transmit the signal from the microphone. So some other cables and cords that you need for recording are, you need a power cord. So when using handheld recorders like this, don't do that. 
Is everybody awake? Yep. <laughs> Don't rely on batteries for your recorders. Yeah. You'll, you'll get into a recording, you'll get into a practice session, you're like, man, that lick, that was the one. That was the one. You look over and the recorder's off because your battery died. All right? Just get an a, a, a AC extension, uh, AC cable extension, call it a day. Yep. All right? And more, having more extension cords than you think you need is a good thing because if we were giving this presentation and we didn't have this power drop at the bottom of the stage, we'd have to plug into one of these outlets on the side of the room and that can be a drag because that ultimately could have an influence on where you set up your recorder. And so if you want the recorder to be close to you, have lots of extension cords. So we talked about smartphones. All right, you have an Apple GarageBand, come standard, it's free. Fantastic for this stuff, all right? So you have an Android FL Studio Mobile. I think it's like 15 bucks. Fruity Loops is what FL stands for. If you if you take that away, you probably remember Fruity Loops better than FL Studio. Um, like $15. It's a great piece of this puzzle. All right. There are aftermarket microphones that will plug directly into your smartphone. All right. If you are going to start with this route and you are bunch, uh, budget conscious, I would say start there. All right. As you start to get some more experience, move on, and you got a little bit more cash because that Easter gig paid, all right, <laughs> then you can start supplementing uh, some of your equipment. All right, so I'd say smartphones, definitely a good one to, to start with. All right, then moving into personal recorders. We've got uh, the Zoom uh, H4, H4n, and that's the one that just woke you all up. Uh, that is a great step up. Absolutely wonderful step up. All right. One of the things that you need to look for if you go that route, make sure that it will supply phantom power. All right. If you have a condenser microphone, you're not using the onboard microphones that are on there, which are, are pretty good, you need to be able to power it. Either you need to have a, a battery in line for that microphone to power it. Or that needs to supply your phantom power. If you've got phantom power turned on, it's going to eat your batteries up like that. All right. Another reason to have that plugged in. Um, if you want to up your game again, and this is getting a little bit more towards uh, permanent install, you can use an audio interface. All right. Your microphones can plug right into this, and it's going to transfer sound via USB to your computer. And then you will need some sort of digital audio workstation, a DAW. And then, to be honest, some of the uh, uh, USB audio interfaces supply one, a very, very basic one. So some of these have different types of effects, especially this, this Zoom. It'll have auto gain, which will change your gain of the microphone. We'll talk about gain here in just a second. That and any other effects, compressors, limiters, that kind of stuff, turn all of that off. All right? We want a good representation of what you're putting into that mouthpiece and what is coming out of that belt. So in these little guys, they even have an interior path for the audio signal, starting with the preamp. So a microphone by itself doesn't produce enough signal to go directly onto your recording medium. So we have to pass it through a mic pre. Now, the mic pre takes that low signal and boosts it up to line level so it can be usable. The better the preamp, the cleaner and less noisy the boost is. And that boost is called gain. So this is the basic block diagram for how the mic pre works. So you plug your microphone in, it goes over here to the amplifier that's controlled by a pot, and then from there it's now line level so you can use it with a whole bunch of other professional audio devices or you also have an A to D converter, analog to digital converter built into these things. All right, that is going to take your acoustic energy into electric and then into digital. It's going to turn that into sound into ones and zeros. All right, you take that, it'll store it on whatever uh, storage is in that, whether it's a hard drive, an SD card, compact flash, whichever. Just really 
quick thing about file types when you're recording. There's two types of files that we're gonna we're gonna quickly discuss. There's uncompressed files and there's compressed files. An uncompressed file that you're probably familiar with is a WAV file, uh, WAV. Now a compressed file could be an MP3 or an AAC file. A uncompressed file like WAV means that it is as close to a full representation of what that original acoustic energy source was creating. There isn't any information lost in the translation. It's direct translation from what that acoustic sound was. Now in MP3, they're also called lossy compressed files because they lose information to make that file smaller. And so it takes information that it doesn't need necessarily. So in silences or, or high-end frequencies that aren't being used, it takes them away. Way. You ever watch an old movie? You're sitting there and you see like a little smudge print, like just kind of pop up in one frame and then it goes away. Audio does that too. You can start to hear that actually in the recording. Um, yeah. And a, a lot of that, here go back to that slide. So you take that analog signal that's nice and smooth and you're basically creating these little steps. So the more steps you have, the better of a translation and closer to that smooth curve that you have. So after you have a recording on your recorder, now you can listen back. And so that's where we need our output transducer, which is headphones or speakers, which it basically is the opposite of the microphone. It's taking an electric signal and turning it back into a sound source that you can, you can listen to. Um, I, I strongly recommend that you have either a good pair of headphones or a good pair of speakers that you're very familiar with, that you have spent hours and hours listening to your favorite CDs. It doesn't even have to be tuba or euphonium CDs, but it just has to be something that you're very familiar with how those headphones sound, because that's going to give you the best chance of critiquing yourself when you're listening back to your recordings. All right, um, so in these recorders, we're going to talk about metering and gain, all right? You hear the term gain and volume used simultaneously. They're two different things, all right? Gain is what is happening to the input. How much are you letting that through the door? You open the door all the way, you can't handle what all is going to come through it, all right? That's going to overload your preamp and cause distortion, all right? So a good rule of thumb at this level is whatever level comes in is what level you want to go out. All right? So you want to play your softest, you want to play your loudest. If you see red lights, you need to back off your gain a little bit. Okay? Yeah. All right. And then what you hear through your speakers, you want to make sure that what you're sending it is not a starved signal, meaning you're getting so much gain, but you're only, you know, at a one or a two volume. Make sure that whatever's coming in is going out. When you think of turn up and, and turn down, there's usually a dial, like on the zoom, there's a dial uh, with numbers. All right, the higher the number, the higher the gain. All right, when I say back off, it means go down to a lower number. All right, so lessen the gain. Play your loudest, and if it's not hitting red or clipping or distorting, you're, you're safe on that end. Play your softest if it's still picking up and you can hear yourself over the air conditioner and the phone ringing and two doors away and the person that's breaking up with a girlfriend in the practice room right next door. You're, you're going to be good. One yep. more thing on that is when you're setting your gain, so it, it could be a little confusing because you have 6, 12, 24, 48. Why are the numbers getting bigger? Well. They're negative, so you're going up to zero. So zero is your is your loudest. So and, and different things have different meterings. You just need to look yep. for where is your top point. Is it zero, or is it twenty? I mean, just look on your on your meter. All right. If if you're lucky enough to have colored lights on your meters, red is bad. Bedroom is the space that you'll have between your loudest point and distortion. Okay. You want to never cross into that distortion. So give yourself a little headroom just in case you're going through that lick and you're just really psyched about it. So, right. so like on, on this Zoom recorder, 
Like, I wouldn't really want to go above, like, minus six with my level at my loudest point. Because that, that gives me enough wiggle room that I'm going to stay away from that, that, that red line. Uh, phantom power is, is just a power signal sitting down in an XLR to power a condenser microphone. All right? Make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure that when you go to either plug in or unplug a condenser microphone, make sure the phantom power is off. That's that awesome pop that you hear, and guitarists are notorious for it, right? <laughs> so make sure that that is off, because that can actually damage your microphones. Um, or your recorder. Or your recorder, yeah. Room acoustics, all right? This room is awful. <laughs> and it's good. Depends on what you want to get out of it, all right? Uh, one of the things you can do getting into a room, walk in and just clap, all right? And go ahead. Did you say that this is a live or a dead room? Dead. All right. Pretty dead. All right. Live room, going to have a lot of echoes. All right. <laughs> going to have a lot of refraction off of solid surfaces. All right. So part of the reason why this room is so dead is all of this wood ribbing around to help break up the sound. All right. So typically anything less than uh, two milliseconds is considered a dead room. And anything over... Uh, 0.5 milliseconds is considered a live room. Uh, so it's good and bad, all right? Depends on what you want to get out of it, all right? If you are in an overly dead room, you have nowhere to hide. You have no help from your surround. You can't tune with the cord. But you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you can either play it or you can't. It's what you need to work on, all right? A live room, overly live room, you play sustained notes, you can tune, you can tune with yourself, work on some aural theory. Um, also, you can sneak a lot of uh, breaths in in places that you wouldn't normally do uh, because the, the sound is still happening. Um, we have a couple scenarios, and this is kind of like the practical part of this. First thing, uh, Alex is going to talk about uh, probably one that you're really familiar with, and that's the practice room. All right, a nice, cozy, smelly, eight by eight foot practice room with a piano and you and your tuba and your bag and your gig bag and now your recorder and it's awesome. We have them here, but you can get a lot out of a practice room. So in these small spaces, one of the things that is an issue is reflections off the walls. And so trying to get this microphone not too close to a ceiling or a wall that you're going to get that direct reflection off that, what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and get as much of the direct sound and not the reflections of the room. So just going to play through this excerpt and I'm going to place this mic. We don't want to get the mic placed directly down the bell because that wind stream has it's going to be very similar to that proximity effect that we were talking about before so you want to place the microphone just a little bit off access so I have it kind of shooting across the bell aiming for that top edge so here it's like imagine this 8x8 room. It's away from the wall, it's away from the ceiling. Now we're going to record this. I'm going to turn that gain down just a little bit. all of a sudden. <laughs> um, 
So this is going to be probably one of your better options for close proximity uh, recording. You wouldn't really want to use uh, a condenser microphone in this situation. You can. It's going to pick up a, a lot more of the reflections in the room. This is going to stick to really what is coming out of the tuba. So, playing in your parents' basement, all right, low ceiling, big open room, all right. Make sure that you get your microphones away from walls. A good idea when you're recording is think about if this was a performance for someone, think of that microphone as, as a set of ears that's listening. So like in a small basement where you don't have that height to really get this above the, the tuba bell that much, you can set it kind of in front of the person, kind of like where your private teacher would be listening to you or where your parents would be if you were playing them something that you're about to play a solo of. Um, so that you can also use that method that we did with Jeff for that first recording. You can do that in any of these scenarios. Um, but the, the more space you have, the further and further away you can put a condenser microphone and get more of that room sound, more like what you hear on a, a classical recording solo record. Yeah, that hits, that hits our third one. In a bigger open room, you can move to a, a condenser microphone, kind of get more of an accurate picture of what's going on in the room. Um, all right, so we talked about the signal chain. We talked about the acoustic energy coming from a tuba, going into a mic, down a mic cab cable, sitting on a mic stand, going into um, a personal recorder, an audio interface to a computer, making a recording of yourself, listening back, all right? So we kind of touch all that in a whirlwind. And I understand that it's, it's dry, it's dull, it's, you know, being read stereo instructions to, I understand. But this is one of the tools that you can use to really advance yourself when you don't have the money to go and take private lessons with, you know, the, the top pro in the area. Or your professor is going to be out of town because he or she has stuff going on and you've got a recital coming up. All right. Or, is, or you're working with a, a piano player that's accompanying right. you and you want to send her where you're at in that piece so she knows the tempo that you're going to play at and, and stylistically what you're going to do. Yeah. So uh, get creative. We don't have all the answers. We love to learn. Uh, Alex is fantastic with coming up with harebrained ideas to record stuff. Uh, you saw his, uh, his table and mic stand magic. Um, he also uses dog toys uh, to wedge microphones and a sousaphone so they don't bounce around in there when he's dancing. Uh, I know it's hard to believe. Uh, but, I mean, that's, that's really about it. I mean, the more you do it, the better you get. Well, we want to say thank you so much to all of you. Thank you to the, uh, the panel for the Tuba Euphonium Workshop for having us. Um, the last thing we want to leave you with, though, these recordings, if it is that important to you, you are submitting this to a Summer Festival, first round of military um, auditions. If it is that important to you, don't rely on your own skills unless you know that they are, are top-notch. Hire a professional. All right? It is so worth it. You can be the player and your producer. You're listening and saying, you know what, that wasn't that great. But you have to be honest with yourself. All right? Record yourself. Record yourself often. On behalf of myself and Alex Ryder, uh, thank you all so much, and enjoy the rest of the conference.